Hello to everyone out there in open networking world. We really wish that we were able to be together in person, but we are still living in this world of um, taking our health seriously. Um, we have what is a super session today. We have both an incredibly amazing and interesting presentation from a number of experts within China Mobile, followed by a panel with um, experts and executives from China Mobile and Verizon. You are getting basically a double dose of expertise from some of the most important and significant uh, operators in the world in this session. So I hope that you are prepared to take this ride because it's going to be a great one. So, uh, as I said, that is the structure of our, of our session today, and we are going to start with a presentation coming from four experts at China Mobile. Uh, we have uh, Lei, Lei Huang, uh, Yan Yang, uh, Yuhan Zhang, and Kaisi Liu, um, all of whom are uh, incredibly uh, well-versed scholars and researchers who are doing the work to transform the largest mobile operator on our planet. And so with that, I would like to hand it over um, to Lei to um, start the presentation. Hello everyone, welcome to the session, the state of telecom operators adoption of intelligent networking. Um, as the most popular technical field in recent years, AI has been widely used and researched in communication industry network management, operation and maintenance are traditional communication industry services. Operators and vendors have done a lot of exploration on how to make network management more automatic. However, Automation is not enough. Under the current technology trend, we should make the internet network intelligent and autonomous. So today we have scheduled this session for sharing the state of telecom operators adoption of intelligent networking. This session consists of two decks, uh, presentation deck and panel deck. Let's start with the presentation deck. In the presentation, we will first, firstly introduce what is intelligent networking, then share with you about what operators have done in trying to build intelligent networking ecosystem, include EOAG intelligent networking survey, white paper, and some other current works across community organization, and we'll introduce some specific best practice from operators. In the end, we provide uh, um, recommendations for reference. Last of work we did in the early stage was network automation. So what exactly is network intelligence? Combining the current definition of network intelligence by various organizations, we give a reference explanation that is um, a network empowered by AI technologies and systematic integration of AI and communication network on hardware, software systems and processes to realize lower cost, higher efficiency and agile business. And currently there are various open source and standards organizations that have contributed their efforts in the process of exploring the realization of network intelligence. In order to deeper understand current status of network intelligence in industry, the Elephant EOAG organized a large-scale survey in Elephant at the beginning of the year. Um, this is um, in this topic. We will firstly introduce the survey and analysis. Combined with EOAG current work, we will start out and share CSP's requirements and explorations in AI and intelligent networking. Yuhan, as the main contributor, will share with us both the survey and the follow-up white paper. Let's welcome Yuhan. Okay, thank you, Lei. Uh, today, I'm glad to have this opportunity to present our work on intelligent networking and CI AI survey and white paper. 
take uh, down, please. The Intelligent Networking Survey is EOH's first survey that opened it to the entire AL phone community. A total of 65 people participated, and those participants covered such a wide range. We consider that survey result data could basically represent the requirements of AI industry. It's done. The survey contains uh, these uh, six parts. Based on the feedback from the survey, we conducted an in-depth analysis analysis, but uh, consider the season time is limited, we only take a brief introduction about some key findings from the survey feedback. Uh, take down, please. Uh, the first key finding is about intelligent networking's current, current progress in industry. Uh, as you can see from this page, nearly half of operators are still in early stage of assisted O&M, and only about 16% of vendors have a long-term plan for scale development of AI into their architecture or products. In general, telecom industry is still in early stages of intelligent transformation with relatively low-level autonomous networks. Which down, please. Uh, the second key finding is about strategy for improving intelligent networking. We could find that leading operators and vendors introduce and account intelligent network applications through unified AI platforms. A consensus could be reached that developing unified platform is essential to improve network autonomy. Pitch down, please. And the third, third key finding is about application scenarios. Top three AI application scenarios are the industry most interested in terms of to be operations and maintenance, service assurance, and the network optimization. AI has being put highest expectations on those scenarios since they are those one directly serving customers and frontline operators. Which down, please. Uh, in terms of ecology strategy, a conclusion could be reached that industry are currently in need of both specification and open certification of intelligent network service and network AI algorithms. Pitch down. Thank you. Uh, in terms of the Engagement of different SBOs and OSCs, ORAN, CGPP, and ITLUT are the most popular ones among the respondents participated in. Nearly half of the respondents are engaged in ONAP and ORAN. Uh, down, please. And uh, uh, the bow is a brief introduction to the survey and analyze from the results of the survey. We can get the current studies of the uh, industry and the development demands on the industry. Based on the survey analyzed results and the CSP's requirements, the UAG is uh, published intelligent networking, AI, and ML white paper to identify and highlight the last bit thinking and recommendations for building and supporting intelligent networking. Uh, in particular, we first introduced the motivation and definition and their contact detailed analysis and uh, main meaning on the network intelligence survey. Based on results of the survey analysis, combined with the current operator work priorities we have collected in UAG, we put forward suggestions for the development of the network intelligence industry from the operator's perspective. Finally, these suggestions and requirements are implemented to put forward a call to action for construction of an intelligent network ecosystem. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Yihan, for the good introduction. Um, this white paper, as you can see in the screen, uh, will be published in October. Um, EOAG will successfully, successfully hold various meetings for, from October to November to promote this white paper, include our one summit. And in the follow-up, we will also launch a series of webinars with LFN to promote the white paper. Welcome to download and read this white paper. We believe you will learn about the development trends of intelligent networking you care about. The next work we have done is EOAG data and model sharing project. Um, the reason why we propose this project is that data standardization, shared data sets, and models are the long-term challenges of intelligent transformation that operators must deal with. 
And basic data algorithm framework is also the most required capabilities provided by unified intelligent network platforms. In order to help bridge the work between operators and manufacturers and enable operators and vendors to share data sets and models, we have established um, this project. We work with tech to promote this project to collect network intelligence scenarios from operators and vendors. One of the projects we are currently implementing with Annocate is AI ML for telecom cloud use cases. From the feedback of the survey, um, the highest priority to work on is testing and certification services for intelligent network. Um, today, I have invited Yan Yang, who is the CVC vice chair, to share with us the collaboration work between CVC and us. Welcome, Yan Yang. Uh, thank you, Lee. Uh, next, I will give a brief introduction of the testing and certification plan for network intelligence. From uh, EOAG survey, lack of uh, quantitative indicators and their certification service is a problem that must solve from partial autonomy to high level autonomy. So, building an open and effectiveness evaluation system has become high priority industry demand. So, in order to promote this work, CVC and the UAG are working together to collecting their testing and their certification requirements and the plan to launch the new branch of Anarchate Assurance Program to accelerate the de uh, development of next generation AAP uh, badges for intelligent networking, focus on supporting the telecoms adoption and the deployment of network intelligent technologies and uh, exploring their best practice from uh, the whole industry. So if you are interested in this work, welcome to join us. Thanks. Thank you, Yan. Um, after the intro introducing the current EOAG's work in building an intelligent network ecosystem, we hope to share with you the current operator's exploration and practice through some typical operator practice cases and hope to bring you thoughts and resonance. In this part, I have invited China Mobile Risk representative Kai Shi to bring us the current practice of China Mobile in the process of exploring and developing network intelligence. Welcome to Kai Shi. Thank you, Lei. I'll take it from here. So in, ch in this chapter, with great pleasure, I'll share with you some of, some of our best practices, best practices in exploring network intelligence. Uh, next page, please. Hello. Uh, in, so in July this year, China Mobile has issued the first best practice white paper. We have, where we have officially set the target of reaching L4 level autonomous network by 2025 with the most complex and largest scale network in China. And in fact, on this planet, in terms of number of users, we spend $140 billion on network operation and, and maintenance every year. So this project is supposed to save us a huge cost and offer better service assurance, deliver ultimate user experience at the same time. Next page, please. So to achieve this goal, we have developed the closed loop evolution path. Following the top design, every round of the evolution starts from level evaluation to identify the common shortcomings. This way, coordinated planning and targeted measures could then be made to tackle the problem and progress could then be made. Use cases will be first implemented in selected subnet to, uh, to verify the feasibility and business value. High value use cases will then be widely adopted. So far, we have successfully launched almost 80 pilot use cases in more than 27 provincial companies of China mainland, covering the whole uh, life cycle of network planning, deployment, maintenance, optimization, and operation. Next, next please. Uh, 
Here we have chosen seven typical use cases successfully deployed and well verified in prevention companies, highlighting the, the business values or quantitative results created by each one. Taking the, the, the last one's example, the intelligent IDC refrigeration, uh, with this use case adopted on the whole network, an estimated 220 million kilowatts could be saved each year. This will not only achieve lower cost for operators, but also a great step to promote sustainable development and low carbon production. And that's all for my part. Thank you. Thank you, Kaixi, um, for the good sharing of the China Baba House best practice. Um, Based on the current status of our industry practice and combined with the survey results of the survey, um, we think that um, telecom industry is still in early stage of um, intelligent transformation with relatively low level autonomous networks, um, in terms of which EOAG will continue to focus on building intelligent networking ecosystems through collect operators' AI ML requirements, collaborate with and promote relevant open source communities and projects. And consider from CSP's perspective, uh, we have write down some of the recommendations here for your reference, and we will talk about it in our panel deck. Above uh, the whole content of the slides, thank you everyone for hearing. And thank you everyone of you presenters. Um, this was a great deal of amazing information. And now we transition into the panel portion of this One Summit Super Session on Intelligent Networking. Now we turn to our panel and I'd like to introduce our panelists. We have Lingli Dang from China Mobile, Stephen Casey from Verizon, and Beth Cohen, also sometimes known as Machetti Cohen, from uh, also from Verizon. Um, thank you, panelists, uh, for taking time to be with us um, today. And let's go on and kick off our um, interactive part of this super session. I'd like to start with um, what are the drivers um, behind um, wanting to look at um, intelligent networking? Um, are these uh, more business or technical oriented? And um, do you think it is the operational efficiency that, that we can achieve or is it making the network itself more intelligent? Um, Langley, could I ask you to kick off uh, with your first answer to this first question? Sure. I think for, for our case, um, the drivers are both and even more. Um, so for China Mobile, our business challenge, the number one challenge is how to manage efficiently the largest mobile network in the world. Uh, we're serving at almost 1 billion customers with 5 million base stations. And for which operation and maintainers we are hiring about 60,000 engineers and spending annually more than 20 billion US dollars in total. So to address this challenge, our solution is to design and deploy at scale autonomous networks, which drives the realization of end-to-end -end, um, intelligent capabilities, enabling the use of artificial intelligence within the closed control loops. And some of our use cases include intelligent 5G service assurance, which reduces the network orders and increases the efficiency for operation maintainers and making our financial department very happy because we reduce the operation costs. And another one is optimized configuration management of 5G radio network and also automatic provisioning of enterprise network services, uh, which improves uh, the coverage and making our customers, both individual and enterprise customers satisfied. And in addition to that, we also deploy AI driven energy efficiency, uh, which reduces the power consumption of our 5G based stations by almost 25 percent 
And that makes our network intelligence transformation really important because it actually contributing to save our planet, right? Mm -hmm. So I'd like to add on to that. Um, so Verizon has a somewhat different challenge because not only do we have the wireless network, but we also have the wireline network too. So we have a, a mix and a heterogeneous network that we're maintaining. And of course, we also have a global presence. Uh, so for us, our challenges are certainly business challenges um, and operational challenges. So we are looking to, for the intelligent networks to, to really address the, uh, how the operations uh, people are supported and get more efficiency out of the engineers that we use um, to maintain our networks, but also of course, um, use the networks more effectively and more efficiently. And I know, Steve, you probably have some something to add to that. Yeah, I would add on to that, Beth. I agree 100% with both of what you've said. There's also a complexity factor that we have to consider here as well. As our networks become more resilient and we have layered networks upon networks, it becomes more challenging to identify issues in the network. And we find that AI ML helps us to narrow those points down without flooding our operations teams with too many messages that they can't use and focusing on the point where it needs to be solved. And we see over time that this will have to become more and more integral to increase that overall customer experience by leveraging metrics more and more and applying it across different layers in the network itself. So what I am hearing is improve efficiency, but also make internal operations folks happier improve customer experience and save the planet that 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 is what we're up to um as we um look at uh this this transformation um that's amazing um related to going back to what we uh looked at in uh the presentation um the euag just did this um survey and um, what I'm interested in is not the, the you know, sort of obvious results, but what was most surprising to you that, that you found out through um, this survey activity? Um, Steve, could I ask you to start there? Sure, I'd, I'd be happy to, Heather. What actually surprised me is if you look at the numbers and you look at the results, one way you can say is there's not as much AI going on as you expected, and especially in, in some of the areas like autonomous networks and things like that. But I actually found it interesting to say 20% said they were fully autonomous or highly autonomous. That number actually surprised me because given the fact that it's challenging to get to, get to the data, it's challenging to find AI ML resources that can work on the data, and it's challenging to process that up to the, the operations team through automations and systems like that can, that can actually set up true autonomy, that they were that far along. So it was, it was pleasing to see that actually the 20% seems small, but in my viewpoint, that's actually further along than I expected because we hear the buzz about AI all the time and everybody's doing it. But the reality is when you actually start looking into it and see who's doing this, there's not as many people that are actually doing AI as we would expect. And we hope to see that improve over time through a number of different projects and especially open source projects that can help to accelerate that. Yeah. Um, Lindley, um, you know, did you find anything um, surprising about the, the results of the survey uh, and hearing the voice of your fellow operators? Yeah, I would like to say what a coincidence. Um, <laughs> What surprised us most is also, you know, what we found out with the raw data and after we compare it with um, a more in-depth analysis is that we found out that the industry currently actually lacks a basic consensus on what is um, the intelligent transformation of the network or in other words, the goal and the path of how to build an autonomous network. Despite the fact that many industry organizations and companies, um, you know, as I said, have launched related work, 
And um, also, you know, like operators, um, China Mobile have also included autonomous network construction in our own five-year deployment plan. But in fact, through this survey, we found that um, the interview is actually do not fully understand what the ultimate goal of network autonomy is. And for example, we found out that two interviewees said that um, their company's network autonomy level or intelligence level has already reached level five, the ultimate goal for full autonomy. But when we later compile, combined their feedback with extra information about their application coverage or rollout stages um, before we make the comprehensive judgment, we found that at least one of them, which represents 50% in total, actually does not meet the core requirement for level five, which states full field or domain and universally capable of self-evolution. And we believe that this is a very good reflection, which shows that um, there is actually no well-established industrial consensus of what it will look like or the ultimate goal for building network intelligence. And in view of that, we would like to address this issue because we have already included in our five-year plan. So to kick off the practical application in our production network, we have to develop an implementation architecture and level-based evaluation system. Uh, which are specific to our own you know, operation and maintainer systems to guide the transformation of our network operation and maintainers uh, transformation in all of our 31 subsidiaries in mainland China. And we introduce autonomous capabilities at different levels of the network operation and management system and conduct evaluation one or two times annually to trigger a iterative evolution. And the result for the very first iteration, which is partially done in the first half of the, this year is quite encouraging. And at the same time, we are fully aware that there is still a long way to go for reaching the level four goal for our network. And um, we firmly be believe that uh, only by joint efforts with the industry um, that we can actually continue this journey. So um, we summarized and published our thinking practices as well as corporation suggestions in a white paper um, in July this year and further contributed uh, the generalized methodology which we believe would be also applicable to other service providers and also our um, you know, industrial partners for their references in the form of technical specifications to standards organizations, including TM Forum, 3GPP, ITUT, etc. And um, that is what we have found out the most surprising to us and that is uh, what we are react and to it and trying to address it. And um, I hope um, it will also be of help to our fellow and service providers as well. And uh, very welcome um, other partners to join our, um, our practice and in building um, advanced levels of autonomous networks together. Yeah. So it sounds as though both, both you, Lingley, and Steve were both surprised by um, the combination of maybe self-reporting being um, optimistic at a time when um, the consensus of achievement is, is still, um, I guess, itself under question. Um, uh, Steve, Steve, anything you you have to, to add back into that, or Beth, do you want to jump in? I'm good on that one, Heather. I, I agree with, with what Lingley has said in that. Yeah, yeah. All right, um, then uh, let me go to my next question, which is, um, 
we've talked about you know where people might be or might think they are in the journey and even what does this journey even look like um getting started or moving along the path in the journey obviously there are going to be challenges so um beth you know what do you see as the biggest obstacles with what you know which which we need to uh, overcome um as an ecosystem so i'd say there's two sets of challenges one is internal to specific companies and i'll talk a little bit about them in a minute but the other one is an industry-wide <clears throat> challenge. As Ling Lee mentioned, I don't think there's a consensus about what, in fact, intelligent networking even is. <clears throat> and as we discovered from the survey, um, many operators um, are focused on the operational aspects and less on the, on the intelligent networking as in algorithms and automation. So, uh, and those are really two different components. You really need to address both. Um, internally, um, many of our challenges have revolved around, uh, you know, as a telecom, Verizon um, in various forms has been around for over 100 years. And, uh, you know, many of our operational systems are, they're not 100 years old, but they're... <laughs> <laughs> but they're not young. <laughs> not young, right. And, and um, you know, you can, you can put all your lovely GUIs around the core data, but you know, at the end of the day, it's very, very difficult to rebuild those data sets. Um, and so, you know, we have, you know, these sets of data that, that were built or designed, you know, 30, 40, 50 years ago. And, uh, you know, we're, we're pulling the data out, but it's not necessarily data that can be really applied in the in the way that you would expect for for intelligent networking uh, because you know things have changed over time uh, so that that's one um, challenge another challenge is of course um, Verizon is made up of uh, a set of a number of companies that have been merged over the years and each one came with their own set of <laughs> applications and data um, and, and, and OSS BSS. <laughs> yes, and OSS BSS systems. So, you know, that, that's a challenge in itself, you know, just, just you know, crossing through those silos. Um, and I know, Steve, you, you've, you've uh, found some challenges as well related to uh, algorithms and uh, data sets. <laughs> exactly. They're very diverse. They're very different. Um, consistency would be very nice because most of your time is spent in, in data wrangling. And then you, you'll have, um, I think we found at least three to five different names for Jitter uh, across the different data sets. It would be really nice. Uh, to have okay, I need to pause you. Jitter is named Jitter. differently within a telecom networking's own data, like data systems. It's pretty sad, well, yeah, isn't it? <laughs> exactly, because we have a number of different partners that we work with, and every one of them comes up with their own little twist. So you have to take those twists mm -hmm. and put them back into something meaningful. So again, you can layer that up and look through the network layers all the way from your physical layer all the way up through your virtual layers to your applications. And, and that's the challenge is going across those, because most of the time when somebody calls with a problem, they're not saying, I have a problem on my optical network. They're saying, my application's running slow. And that's where you start at. And then you start going through the layers to figure out what is really the problem. Yeah, so um, Lingley, um, you know, you were mentioning, you know, the size of China Mobile's network and, you know, your subsidiaries. Are you finding the same thing? Like, are there this many different words for jitter? Um, you know, what what challenges are you seeing out there in 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 the world trying to do this? Right. I first of all, I'm 100% agree with what Beth and Steve has just said. Data has always been a challenge for us, and um, because data is actually to us is the fuel of artificial intelligence. And we have a tons of, you know, different data, as you can imagine, um, you know, produced as a result of our OM system each day. 
that without a unified data standards system established, um, these data could hardly add value to the network intelligent platforms. And um, another perspective regarding data's challenge is that we found um, there's also a lack of effective data governance solutions. Inside our you know, network, we have different management domains. We have, you know, like a technical domains and data does not flow freely among different domains, among different administrative, you know, um, departments. That for us is, is quite challenging because AI actually consumes data, especially with um, the use case that Steve has just mentioned. We need to leverage cross-domain, end-to-end data to diagnose what are actually the broken part of an end-to-end -end service link. So data governance is also important for us to uh, establish inside our system. And aside from the data perspective, we also find out uh, environment is actually, we believe the number one challenge for us to do our intelligent R&D um, because our network is so complex. It's highly dynamic. Well, not flexible. And the complex environment characteristics um, and its uncertainty actually provides extremely rich scenarios for us to do the network intelligence. We see a potential like blue ocean. But at the same time, the complexity of the system or network and its data also slows down the innovation in network intelligence innovation because we could not use the live production network environment to do um, you know the R&D applications because there has been carry grade requirements for our services right well the research and development of um, AI technology actually require experimental feedback, especially those involve reinforcement learning and deep learning and things like that. And also um, all the machine learning algorithms are actually de uh, iterate quickly if the actual data characteristics and changes in the production network, which means that it has to be retrained and optimized um, in our cases is on a one or two months basis. Hmm. So without an environment for us to try new algorithms and its revision or models on the production network is the number one challenge for us to actually to do their algorithms and improve them and consistently. And we believe that it is important for us to build an end-to-end -end experimental network environment and uh, we're also committed to build that one, at least, you know, inside China mobile's rim and open it up to our um, partners and even academia um, to try and help us uh, to do more innovative um, experiments in that environment before, you know, we can actually deploy them in our production network um, after proper verification. And, and I'd like to add, um, so <clears throat> and I, I have experience with other AI um, type activities. Uh, in a previous life, I did work on um, uh, speech recognition, which of course uses AI. And uh, what, what uh, there's a lot of bias that can get added into the algorithms, um, unintentional bias, and um, also a lot of black box thinking. Um, so, which is a big challenge and because you really need to validate that those algorithms are actually working and not just magic pops out. Uh, so that, that's an additional challenge that, that you know, I, it sounds like you're, you're addressing as well in the, <laughs> by having an experimental um, data set to work with. So that's a, that's a very key um, issue that I think the open source community can really address by creating that sort of 
standard data set to work against that would be anonymized and, and you know, and not proprietary to each of the telecoms. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the, the complexity of the network and the complexity of the bias we don't even recognize inside um, our heads, it sounds like. Um, our, our, our challenges. And um, because uh, I think both uh, both uh, Ling Lee and Beth just sort of recognized, you know, how we start to deal with this complexity um, and how we deal with, um, you know, not, not being driven by our own bias because we're looking inward rather than outward um, brings me to open source and collaboration. Um, so, you know, we have some projects that we've gotten kicked off. Um, let's talk about, you know, how you as operators are contributing to those projects and also how you would like other operators and the entirety of our ecosystem to participate and what projects uh, should we be considering also starting at the same time and how do we use open source to help us uh, accelerate this and improve. Steve. I'll take this one, thanks Heather. So if you look through the overall flow in the process of developing machine learning algorithms, you have devices producing data in, an intelligent, in a, in a non-intelligent and an intelligent network. You have data collection, data preparation, and then actually building the models. And if you slice and dice those down and look at them, really the first two components comprise about 80% of your work effort. So it's the collection and the processing. The last piece is really more minor is the, the modeling process. We'd like to see that flipped around because the more we can reduce those first two pieces, the faster we can get to the real piece that we want, which is building the models so we can have insights that drive our business and make our customers experience better. So our ask out to open source is to start looking at the collection phase of it to generate the log files today. Those are fine. You know, the systems process those, but can we make it easier to process those log files? Can we put those on a message bus at the same time? So it's easy to pick up that data and start using it. That's one of the, the main first components. The second piece is data granularity. Data is aggregated today from these devices anywhere to 15 minute increments to an hour or longer. And the problem is in these large networks and complex networks, a lot of things change in that time. So a lot of get, things get missed in that signal if it's been aggregated down. So we're asking, go to lower levels of aggregation. And if you can, even step down to raw where it makes sense. So the, the actual telemetry coming off of the device. So we can make that decision quicker and richer. And then finally, the processing piece of it. Right, we have this plethora of different devices that are producing data. They all name things differently. They put them in different formats. They have different metrics in there. You know, can we take that and say, let's put some standards around that. And can we ask the open source community, come up with common naming schemas, come up with common practices for this data and publish what the data means. I can't tell you the number of challenges we go through by getting a data set and then saying, what does this metric mean? Does it have any value? How does it relate? Well, we've got 12 different log files from this one device. How do we put those back together into something meaningful? If that's published, that makes it much easier to get the data scientists going and not have to convert a data scientist into a network engineer as well, because right. then they have to have that skill set to do that. There's projects out there today, like Project Thoth and the Data Project, which are great starting points. But my ask also is to go out there and say, on these other projects that are not related to AIML, make it easier for the AIML teams by doing these things up front so we can expedite the process and make it simpler for everybody to get to quicker insights. Yeah, um, what I really like too is how that sort of, the challenges of um, getting data from devices that is a little, it's too aggregated and not quite fast enough uh, combined with what Lingley you were saying about um, getting the data into the the deep learning systems to train them on something faster than a month basis, right? It, it's um, you know it's we need more data more quickly and more continuously, um, and uh, so Lingley, you know, um, 
you know, hearing both you and Stephen talk about, you know, um, data and its timing together, um, do you have something to add? And also, you know, in the context of how open source can help. Right. Um, as I said earlier, we see that it, it is an urgent need to build an open, innovative experimental environment for intelligent networks on R&D and providing the basic infrastructure, testing environment, data sets, and also, you know, um, um, providing um, input for a generalized um, intelligent platform, which actually provides um, the whole life cycle management for all the network intelligent applications. And uh, it is also reflected in the UAG survey that um, actually, the more advanced stages of the interviewees enter into network intelligence transformation, um, there are more of them actually adopting the unified um, and intelligent platform approach. And for us, we are actually building the intelligent um, um, network platform based on um, ONAP and also um, Kubernetes and uh, several other um, open source you know, projects. And we are also um, integrating with more advanced ML ops and uh, toolings um, from other open source communities. And um, as you could imagine, we also um, establishing in uh, open source infrastructure um, for, for the network, 5G uh, network based on open air interface and also um, some of our other um, open source toolings. So open source are uh, of wider importance for us to build the environment um, uh, for the testing, for the innovation. And we also believe that some of the um, testing and certification program or efforts inside AFN could also be helpful for us to identify or broaden our view in, poten uh, in potential intelligent application providers. So for us, uh, especially for OAM, we have a very restricted suppliers um, you know, um, chain. And um, it is also challenging for us to introduce advanced um, in AI technologies because those suppliers for our OSS systems are not that capable of, you know, um, doing artificial intelligence, especially algorithms innovation, as you can imagine. So if we would like to also leverage the industrial and identify more potential collaboration partners through open certification programs, that would be also a wider help for us um, to get our goal, I believe. Yeah, yeah I, I agree with that as well. <clears throat> I know that we're working on creating the Anakit Assured program, which of course is um, tied into infrastructure and not specific to AI, but, but it will certainly help go a long way. And I think I want to put out a call to action to the vendors um, to support this as well. Um, I know as it, what came out of the survey is the vendors are actually looking at AI as well, um, but I think that they're not as far along as the telecoms were, if I, re if I remember <clears throat> from our analysis. And, and of course, another thing to remember is that there, as I said earlier, there's, there's sort of two types of AI here. There's AI specific to the technology, the network, which, you know, in production, you want it to be in minutes. You don't want it in two months. <laughs> um, and, but also there's the applying to the operational aspect of it. So, so I know that we're doing some work around uh, <clears throat> natural language processing and other types of things that aren't specific to the network, but are still moving along the line of improving our efficiency in the operational aspects of running a, a very large network. <laughs> All right. Um, is there anything else that any of you would like to add um, to this conversation um, before we do our panel? Lingli, yes. 
Oh, yes, uh, just, you know, um, I think inspired also by what Bess has just said. So our current practice has been most focused on the operation layer. But in, in the whole picture, we envision that there will be four layers of network intelligence. The network element layer, um, the domain specific management layer, the end to end operation layer, and on the top of that um, is the business operation layer, which actually um, enables our industrial customers and uh, also expose the network management uh, capabilities if they wish they could control and do self service as well. And we start at the operation layer, which is the middle two layers, but we expect to achieve the ultimate goal, at least for level three or four, we have to also look at what would be needed and add it to the bottom layer, the network infrastructure, as well as um, the top layer, you know, how we could enable and ex expose those capabilities to our customers. And uh, we believe that there needs to be a consistent systematic design to align different, you know, like, technical evolution of standards between different layers because ultimately we would like to in, enable a vertical closed loop which actually triggers by the customer on the top and um, triggers in internal you know like um, closed loops at the underlying layers uh, iteratively and that would be the ultimate goal and um, we are for that case, we are actually also uh, working with multiple standards uh, development organizations that are typically working on different layers. And there is currently none of them are actually working on all the four layers. So we have to indeed, um, you know, leveraging what uh, I think that could also only be done by CSPs working together to drive a multi SDO collaboration, mm -hmm. uh, which is not a loosely, you know, collaborative model as it is now. We really need a tightly um, federated um, collaboration model between these um, different organizations. And in addition to the document driven standards specification development, I think open source as part of um, as the format of running code would be having the uh, specific advantages in enabling the um, interoperabilities that would be quite essential to enable that vertical um, collaboration. All right, Mr. Casey, I think I'm going to leave you with the opportunity for the uh, last word here. Thank you, I appreciate that, Heather. So I would say in tying into what Beth and Ling Lee have said, we look at this as a network intelligence of kind of in two different pieces. And this is kind of reflecting what Ling Lee said also earlier. And that is that you have the intelligence of the network taking care of itself and making sure it's better, self-provisioning, self-help, all those things that keep the network and, and make it go stronger and, and better for the customers. But we also look at it from the application intelligence view as well. And that's the downward view on this. And that is, what does the application need and how do we share that information back with the network? So it's not just the network taking care of itself, but it's taking care of the needs of the application, which then takes care of the needs of the user. And we need to look at both sides of that equation because it's easy to start with saying, hey, make the network better, but it's also make the network better for the applications and change that over time based upon what the needs are. So you have users showing up, you change the network so that it supports their needs and the applications are running. As they are not working as much, the network can change and do other functions that it needs to perform and make this dynamic, fluid type of a network out there and use AIML to build that intelligence for it. And, and, and let me add, not, and it should be um, transport agnostic, i.e. be able to incorporate wireless, wireline and other technologies mm -hmm seamlessly so that the customer doesn't necessarily know what what network the packets are actually going over um, as long it, as it is delivers it through the, the air experience. is it over glass is it still over twisted <laughs> copper pair um, it, it, it shouldn't matter to the customer <laughs> yeah yeah um and at the end of the day i mean i loved what you were saying um steve that it's you know 
making the network more intelligent to better serve the needs of the humans using the applications. And I think that that is a great uh, place to end. Um, I want to thank each of you for joining us on this panel today. I want to thank again, China Mobile for the presentation that preceded this panel. And I want to thank everyone out there in open networking land uh, who has tuned in on our virtual one summit um, and chosen to take in all of this great information. So thank you to everyone out there. Um, this concludes our super session on intelligent networking, AI and ML for One Summit 2021. Um, wishing best of health and uh, good living to everyone uh, who's with us today. <laughs>